I'm Dr. Simon Freiler, consultant in clinical neurophysiology. In this video, I'm going to explain a group of conditions called chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, or CIDP for short, and their treatment. I'm calling it a group of conditions as there is increasing evidence that the underlying pathological mechanisms and treatment responsiveness and outcomes are different. These conditions affect around five to seven people in 100,000 and are caused by an autoimmune process. This is where the body's immune system turns against normal cell structures. In CIDP, quite a variety of immune components are implicated, be they actual cells, such as macrophages, T-cell lymphocytes, or immunoglobulins floating in the plasma. Whilst the process is similar to its more acute relative called Guillain-Barre syndrome or GBS for short, there are a number of important differences. Firstly, there are usually no identified precipitating illnesses. The rate of progression is usually far more insidious and can take many weeks before the symptoms are bad enough for patients to present to their doctor. Indeed, progression should usually continue past eight weeks to establish the diagnosis as a chronic condition. The pattern of weakness can also be more patchy, asymmetrical and multifocal and affects both proximal and distal segments simultaneously. This differs from the typically ascending symmetrical pattern of weakness in GBS. Also, the condition often tends to relapse and remit over many years, whereas GBS is a one-off. In CIDP, the particular autoimmune process targets nerve tissues leading to damage of their structures. Usually, it attacks the myelin sheath, which is a fatty insulating coating of the nerves, which helps them transmit signals rapidly and efficiently. Macrophages are signaled to insert themselves in between the fatty layers and strip these away from the axons underneath. When biopsied, this causes an onion skin appearance type of effect to be seen on the microscope. As the nerve sheaths become increasingly damaged, nerve transmission can fail due to blockage of the nerve impulse signals. Most patients will present with weakness of the arms or legs, but multiple other symptoms may occur, such as facial weakness. The diagnosis is usually made by a specialist in neurology using a combination of characteristics based on clinical acumen, spinal tap examination of cerebrospinal fluid looking for elevated protein with normal white cell counts, and nerve conduction tests. Of course, additional investigations such as blood tests and MRI imaging will also be used to help rule out other causes of weakness. There are a number of subtypes of this disease identifiable on nerve conduction tests. I'll first list them and then I'll explain what I mean. The commonest in around 50 to 60% of cases is standard CIDP. This affects motor and sensory nerves in proximal and distal segments and is relatively symmetrical but doesn't have to be so. This comes in both the subacute form and an acute onset form which needs differentiation from GBS. The next commonest is a multifocal acquired demyelinating sensory and motor neuropathy called MADSEN for short, which is a very asymmetrical form, usually presenting in the upper limbs. This makes up around 20 to 30% of cases. In around 5%, a rarer distal form called DADS, which stands for distal acquired demyelinating symmetric neuropathy can occur. This mainly affects the distal segments and usually the sensory fibers more than the motor nerve fibers. This diagnosis needs a specific blood test to check for an underlying anti-mag neuropathy. There are relatively selective motor forms and relatively selective sensory forms, CISP, and focal expressions of CIDP as well as much rarer entities. There is also another entity called multifocal motor neuropathy, or MMN, which was previously considered part of the CIDP spectrum, but over the last 10 years or so, there has been a growing realization that it probably is a different disease, although it shares a number of important features and characteristics and treatment. Now, all of this is very confusing, even for experts, so let's explain a little about the neurophysiology to give these terms some meaning. The larger peripheral nerves have two main components, the axon, which is the central core wiring of the nerve that transmits the actual signal, and a fatty insulating sheath called myelin. The myelin protects the axon, but also ensures that it maintains signal transmission via saltatory conductance. You can see a more detailed explanation of this in another video by clicking on the i-card above. When the myelin is stripped off, 
in a patchy manner, then the speed of the nerve conduction will become more patchy too, with some of the signals reaching their intended targets sooner and some much later. When this occurs, we get a phenomenon called temporal dispersion, which means that the signal is spread out over time. In this case, all of the muscle fibers will depolarize, but the time it takes to do so is more spread out. Hence, we can see on the motor conduction tests that the duration of the motor responses will be much longer, but the area under the curve should be the same. In conduction block, the degree of demyelination is greater, and so there will be dropping out of signal. Hence, the area of the muscle potentials will be reduced. We can use this information to map out electrically which nerves are being affected and where in the course of the nerve that the demyelinating process is occurring. So, does this make any difference? Surely CIDP is CIDP? Well, yes, new research is showing that the pattern of demyelination can be used to predict recovery, relapses and response rates to treatments. There are numerous electrodiagnostic criteria available, and this is a very specialized area. However, suffice it to say that those of the FNS, the European Federation of Neurological Societies, do have excellent sensitivity and specificity performance characteristics. So let's talk about treatment. As with GBS, there are two aims. Firstly, to limit the disease, and secondly, to manage symptoms. I'll present the recommendations of the European Federation of Neurology Society and the Peripheral Nerve Society's 2010 guidelines. Of course, for any individual patient, any, a discussion with your doctor will be necessary. Number one, for patients with mild symptoms, and this is defined as those that do not interfere with activities of daily living, then a watch and wait policy can be recommended. For those with moderate to severe symptoms, there is a choice of either high-dose steroids or immunoglobulins, intravenous or more recently, subcutaneously. Because IVIG works fastest, this tends to be the recommended first course of action. However, the overall choice depends on a number of factors and so should be tailored to specific patient requirements. If the first option being tried isn't helping, then a switch to the other should be tried. If these don't work, then plasma exchange should be considered. I append a link below which provides their treatment algorithm. Around 60% of patients should respond to any one of these and a further 20% will respond to a second try with one of the others. It's important to note that whilst classic CIDP should be responsive to oral steroids, the more motor predominant CIDPs, MADSAM and MMN, should certainly be commenced with IVIG as these are more refractory to steroids and respond best to IVIG treatment. Failing these methods, other immunosuppressants or cytotoxics could be tried, for example, azathioprine, methotrexate, cyclophosphamide, rituximab, interference, to mention but a few but the evidence base is still not well established for these. Overall, 15% of patients will be refractory to multiple agents and will be left with significant disability. The secondary aim is supportive therapy. An expert multidisciplinary team should be involved to provide physiotherapy, occupational therapy, orthotics when necessary, pain specialists, dietetics, and psychological and social support. Thank you for watching. If you have found this video helpful, please support this channel and my work by clicking subscribe and a thumbs up.